Most of the times we are worshiping God through the lens of our upbringing and our denomination. And Mm. the problem with that is we don't know God for ourselves. We know our grandparents, God. We know our parents, God, but we don't know him for ourselves. And because Mm. we don't know him for ourselves, we're not worshiping him. We're worshiping a figment of who Mm. he is. We're worshiping his representative. Mm. So I would encourage you to actually learn who he is for yourself. All right, you're now in with Lionel Mosby Jr. And this is the Lion and the Lambo podcast where we discuss biblical entrepreneurship, impact, and true success. And I'm so, so excited to have tonight, right? A believer, a worshiper, a musician, an educator, a CEO <laughs> of Love More Music, Miss Hannah Love. Miss Hannah, how, how you doing this evening? I'm good. How are you doing, my dear? I, I'm doing great. I'm doing great. I'm so ready to hear um, just what, what you have to share. Um, I know that you've been grinding in your area of expertise. And so I know that yeah. you're going to have so much that you're going to be to bless people with um, tonight, man. Tonight is going to be great. So how, how's, how's your, your week been so far? It's been good. Um, We're at the end of it. Praise God. (laughs) New week starts tomorrow, but my week has been really good. Yes, definitely. Week has been dope. (laughs) That that's awesome. That's awesome. You know, before we jump into it and really get, you know, just want to touch on, get some more information about your story. You know, what has been? If if you have to just kind of pick one thing, if you say, "When this has been my my greatest win so far as an entrepreneur," um, what would you say that that has been uh, for you? your experience launching there's a phrase that i use with all of my girlfriends Mm. do it afraid um launching a business is scary launching anything is scary we have the ideas Mm. in our head but to take a a concept from idealization to um what's the word i'm looking for to when it's now produced right so you go from the idea to something that's physically in your hand it's scary it's right. hard. Mm. Um, you will lose sleep. So launching my business was something that has been like a turning point um, because I've been doing this mm. for years behind the scenes. There just wasn't a name. There wasn't paperwork. Now there's paperwork. Now there's a mm. name. So now it means something different. Now Uncle Sam knows about it. <laughs> Uncle Sam can take his cut. Um, <laughs> Yes. <laughs> uh, so launching the actual business, just saying, hey, guys, so you know that thing that I've been talking about doing? OK, I actually mm. did the thing. And this is my baby. Meet my baby. Right. <laughs> so actually launching and the launching process, that would be the one thing that was the turn point. Yeah. So, you know, I know you said uh, launching was the, you know, the biggest win so far. I think that's, you know, so true. A lot of times we get so afraid and so scared. And, you know, we, it, it, you know, there was a statement that uh, I think I put out on my Instagram um, a while ago and it was just saying, you know, what happens, you know, it's like, what if it does happen? Right. Because we so we're so quick to think about, well, what if it doesn't or what if we fail or what if this and what if that. Right. And I wrote a poem a couple of years ago and it says we're at the edge of the cliff. I see the fear in his eyes. Right. We're not friends if I don't tell you jump. And I'm not talking about suicide. Right. At the edge of the cliff. I see the fear in his eyes. We're not friends if I don't tell you jump. And I'm not talking about suicide. He like, what if I, I die? I'm like, what if you fly? All he see is brown dirt. All I see is blue skies, right? He's like, what if I die? I'm like, what if you fly? He's paralyzed in his mind, but relief comes after mm-hmm. you die, right? And that's the thing for all of us as entrepreneurs, people who have these gifts or these talents, it's after you step out. You know, when Moses and the Israelites step in, or God departed it, right? And so it's the same thing when we talk about our businesses, we talk about these gifts and talents. It's upon that lunch, right? That that lunch, right, is a win, is a victory. And so if you're lunch, then man, hey, congratulations to you. If you're having lunch, it's not too late for you, right? You still have a chance to get it started, you know? And and for you, Miss Hannah, how did it feel, right, when you actually finally got it off, off the ground? What, what was that feeling like that moment, that day, that next day? So there were two parts, right? There was the day I purchased the LLC. 
I remember it was April because mm. we had gotten our okay. stimulus checks and I said, I'm not going to take a <laughs> stimulus check and buy shoes. I'm not. I am mm. going to do something that I can give to my children. I'm going to purchase something I can give to my children. So I remember I mm. purchased my LLC and I sat and I went, holy crap, this is a thing. <laughs> this is a real thing. <laughs> and then for a year, I didn't tell anyone I purchased the LLC. I purchased it mm. and then I worked. Mm. I purchased it and I bought the, I wrote the business plan. I purchased it. I wrote the module. I purchased it mm. and I got a business coach too. I mm. purchased it and I got a beta group. So I purchased it and I did all of the behind the scenes work. Got you. So by the time I launched a year later, I could confidently say, no, I've been doing this. Right. I had vocal clients right. before I launched the business. I was working with the mm. church before I launched the business. I had written a workbook before I launched the business. I had mm. taught before I launched. So by the time I had my coming out party, right, right. in May, <laughs> I was almost a year old. Mm. So there were two parts of it, right? There was the day that I purchased the LLC and did all the work mm. behind the scenes. And then there was a the day that I put out a flyer and was like, hey, guys, so I did a thing I'm launching my business. <laughs> and everybody was just like, when did you buy the business? How, how long have you been doing the work? Right. Here. Why didn't you tell right. us not your business? That's why mm. you don't tell people that you're pregnant until the baby is in the safe space. You don't tell people that you're pregnant the day the, the, the woman mm. gets the blood work back. You tell people that there's a baby the day before the belly pops. Mm. Right? Gotcha. So I waited until the day before the belly pop before I said, hey, I did a thing. And I remember the night that I did my master class. I was so nervous. <laughs> and then when the master class was done, I remember going, Holy crap, Anoli, I have something in my name and now I can't go back. Because <laughs> mm. people want to know what's next. I can't go back. Right. So then I started to make very strategic moves and I've had my wins and I've had my failures. I had two events that I wanted to launch and I couldn't launch because mm. it just wasn't ready. Um, but the two biggest moments were when I purchased the LLC and then when I actually launched the business a year later. And it was overwhelming. It was scary. I cried because I'm a huge cry baby. Um, <laughs> but it was worth it. That's awesome, man. That is definitely awesome. And I love to hear it. It's like you kept working. You know, you you didn't. Every step was important. And I think that's the mm -hmm. thing. We just have to meet, keep making continual progress. Right. It's not about what we did yesterday. It's about, OK, what can I do today toward the end goal that I'm looking to reach, you know, toward um, this lunch date, right, that I'm looking to have. And you mm -hmm. kept working toward it until you got it launched and off the ground. And um, we're definitely going to get into some more about this master class, some more about uh, this this book that you've written. Right. But I want us to go back now and I want to find out from you, you know, what was when you were coming up, you know, um, in your early years with your family, maybe your, your church community. Um, what was your view on money, right? What was your relationship um, with Ooh. money um, back then? So my, I'm, I'm of Jamaican heritage, right? Okay. My, both of my parents are born and raised on the island. My dad came to this country on a school visa. Hmm. My mother came to this country so that I wouldn't have to apply for my social security numbers. Hmm. She literally came to this country in May. And she had me in October. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> okay. So my parents were not about to have children that had to apply for social security numbers. Right. Right. Growing up, my dad always had, he was a, a, a very typical Jamaican, mm -hmm. right? That joke of Jamaicans having multiple jobs right. is not a joke. <laughs> right. It's not, it's not an over-exaggeration. It's, 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 it's real As life. a matter of fact, <laughs> uh, we look at you funny if you only have a, a full-time job and a oh. part-time job. Like, that's all you have? You, you don't have a night job? Got you don't you. have a weekend? Like, you will have your traditional nine to five, right? And then you have your job that covers your partner. Then you have your job that sends money back home. And then mm. you have your kitty cash. Like, so why don't you have four jobs? I'm, I'm confused. I, did I miss something? So I grew up... <laughs> seeing my dad constantly work mm. my dad always had a nine to five 
And then he had his personal businesses. Right. My father owned a barbershop. I don't know if anyone of any of my viewers or any of your viewers, sorry, <clears throat> are familiar with the Bronx, but my dad owned the barbershop on Six Corners in Tremont. So mm. if anyone from the 80s and the 90s has ever heard about the barbershop on Six Corners, my father owned that shop before it burned <laughs> down. Wow. Okay. My father drove trucks. Hmm. My father uh, went to school and got a degree. Um, my father was in ministry. Hmm. My father, what else did that man do? He owned a bookstore. <laughs> uh, wow. He is a licensed real estate broker. He had his own firm and had employees. Oh, wow. Um, now we talk so in my I, language. So I grew up seeing my dad have multiple businesses right, and right. a nine to five. So mm. if there was something he always taught me, he was like, yes, go to school and get your education. That That's, you take a book from morning. That was the, the line that we heard. Did you talk to Jesus <laughs> and did you check a book from morning? In other words, mm. did, you, did you pray and did you read something that stimulated your brain? I always mm. saw my dad with a book. Gotcha. Every I, I don't have his library. Every months my father read a different book and my father would fly through books and they mm. were not c jane run c dot skip it was always some kind of self-help critical thinking business financial entrepreneurship my father normalized owning a business mm. he normalized having employees he wow. normalized being a ceo before ceos founders and owners was in someone's bio he had three of them Hmm. I remember leaving school to go to his barbershop and seat the floor. I remember uh, leaving high school. And if I was hungry, going to his real estate firm and everyone going, oh, Lovemore's daughter's here. <laughs> <laughs> and I can go right in the back to his office and just sit and do whatever I wanted. I remember when I finally decided to cut my hair, I would walk in his barbershop. There'd be a line of men. I would walk past the line of men, <laughs> sit in his chair, have him cut my hair, then stick up my hand and ask for lunch money. So I grew <laughs> up with my dad having multiple streams of income right. because in addition to having a prayer life, right? And in addition to <clears throat> mm. stimulating your brain, he understood that he could not pass down. And, I, and, what, and I'm going to say this in a way that's meant to hurt your feelings, mm. right? I can pass this down to my children because it's mine. I own right. it. Right. I bought it. The only thing I have left to do is trademark it, but right. I own it. You know right. what I cannot pass down to my, to my children? I can't pass this down to them. You see that? Mm. I don't own this. You know what I can't pass down to my children? The traditional nine to five that I have, because at the end of the day, I still have to pay rent. I, I get a uniform for work. <clears throat> right. I can't take that shirt and give it to my children because it's going to be a laundry shirt. Right. Right. At the end of the day, I have to pass something on to my children that's tangible. Hmm. My children should wake up and pick, say, eeny, meeny, miny, mo, and pick a business that mommy or daddy hmm. started to work from that day. And hmm. I have to go out and have someone else tell them their worth. Right. Yes, my nine to five tells me what I'm worth, but you know what's going to happen in two years when I choose to retire myself? I dictate hmm. what I'm worth. That's and right. That to me is gold. I don't have to ask somebody else for a day off of work. Excuse me? I'm grown. Hmm. I'm a grown woman. What do I look like asking you for the paid time off that I earned and then to feel guilted about <laughs> taking the paid time off that I earned? Excuse Facts. me? No. Facts. So I grew up in a household where my father did not play when mm. it came to earning income. He did not play about signing the front of a check. Mm. What I wish my father taught me was investment. Mm. I wish that he taught me stocks. I wish he taught me the market. I think that's where the church failed. The church has done a poor job. And I was actually talking about this with my sister, one of my sisters earlier today. Mm -hmm. We were talking about gambling. Okay. And um, we grew up in a faith. She still identifies. I no longer identify as that sect of that particular sect of Christianity. I'm still a whole believer. I will pray, prophesy you up under a bus. But we grew up in a sect of Christianity that frowned on gambling as far as the lottery. Right. And in the same pot, they threw in 
don't trade, don't put yes. your money in stocks, which is dangerous because you gamble with your 401k. Huh? The social security that your grandparents are fighting for is actually the social security that you're putting in. Right. Mm -hmm. So they are not benefiting from their own social security. The social security that I'm putting in is actually what's paying their social security check. So what happens when my children choose not to work a traditional nine to five, there's no social security check for me to live off of. So right. the denomination I grew up in would oftentimes say money is the root of all evil. Actually, the Bible says the <laughs> love of money is the root of all evil. And yes. the Bible also says that money solves all things. <laughs> mm. You need money to solve problems mm -hmm. <laughs> and Uno have enough problems. So <laughs> when it comes to faith and Christianity, um, faith and, and money, it is dangerous to think that we are not to spend our money wisely. Right. It is dangerous to think that we're not to save. It's dangerous to think that we aren't to invest, mm -hmm. right? So I grew up seeing my father work, but I never saw him invest. And mm. if he did invest, when he passed, there would be something for me. Life insurance policies wasn't something that he thought to purchase. Mm. I wish he did, mm. right? So if I could say anything to the viewers, please look at your financial portfolio. Build your estate, right? right? You want to make sure that whatever happens after you pass, whomever you're building your future for, they're good. Mm -hmm. Whether it's your biological children, whether it's your nieces and nephews, we can't inherit all the Jordans that we've purchased. Like I, I can pass them on to my children <laughs> if my children wear the same size shoe that I wear. Right. But <laughs> Michael Jordan himself, <laughs> he's financially set because we keep buying the shoes. Right. So, yeah. No, that's that's powerful. You know, that it is it's like two things that, you know, that story just brings out is one, there's a lesson of what we learn from our elders, from our you know parents, uh, maybe even church community that we see. And we need to grasp hold of that lesson and hold on to it hard. Right. Implement it into our life and experience. But then there may be something that our parents didn't know. Right. Um, that our elders didn't understand we have to be wise enough to see where they where they stopped and add on to that you know it, it is not for us to stubbornly right just con just do the thing that they did right because they also learned from what their parents did right and then took that to a different level and it may be um based on the understanding and information that was out then they did the best that they could do at that point. But now we're living in a century where we have, we're in the information age, right? Um, and so when you talk about, like you say, right, investing, right, and, and learning how to make our money work for us, you know, money, you know, I try to have a conversation with my friend, you know, if we start thinking about money as employees, we would do a lot of different things with our money than we do now. Right. Because some of our employees aren't doing anything day in and day out. OK, <laughs> they they aren't doing any work at all whatsoever. Right. You know, what I mean, and what kind of good business owner is just going to have nothing for their employees to do? You know, but that, again, takes us having a different mindset and to start to think differently. Right. And, you know, so I see early on. Right. That, you know, that's looking at your father and what, um, you know, what went on in your household helps you to see that, hey, I want to be on the side of writing checks. Right. Um, I don't just want to simply be on the side of receiving, but I want to be able to be writing some of these checks, too, as well. Um, but what was it or when was it that you saw that you had this gifting um, specifically? Right. Uh, for music. Right. Um, when was it that you started to see and understand that, you know, there's not, I'm not just, I, I just can't, I, it's not that I can just sing, I can sing, right? You know what I mean? When, when was it that, that this started to, you know, pique your attention? I was three. Mm. So my parents, especially my dad, um, he noticed that whenever I would watch Sesame Street, <clears throat> I was homeschooled for a portion of my life. Okay. And my parents noticed that whenever I would watch Sesame Street, whenever the count would come on, I would stop talking. Like just everything would stop. And so my mom assumed, oh, she must like math. <laughs> but when all of the other Muppets were doing math, I couldn't care less. So my dad mm -hmm. went, I don't think it's math. I think it's something else. So he actually mm -hmm. watched me. I was, I was blessed to have parents 
Mm. that would watch their children, right? right? My mom was a homemaker, so she was watching me. Mm-hmm. So my dad noticed that when the count would come on, I would stop, and it wasn't because of math. To date, the count is the only Muppet that sings in a key that's recognized on the piano in a chord that makes sense. So mm. I was responding to the music. Mm. So he said, you know what? Maybe we should put her in piano lessons. Mm. So at five, they put me in piano lessons. Wow. When I turned 10, I went to a different junior high school and my dad said, so what music program them have this song? You need to find some music sitting for do. Said, well, they have a band. Go join the band. <laughs> and find an instrument that makes sense. So don't, don't come in with no with no fluxy fluxy instrument. Go find an instrument that makes sense. So fluxy fluxy is something weak. No, 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 right. no instrument that just spent up like like receipt paper, right? Okay. So <laughs> my Oh, that's hilarious. I walked into band and I saw the horned instruments. So your tubas, your trombones, okay. your trumpets. And those instruments. The trombone is the one that slides. You have five notes. It, it okay. slides in five positions. Your tuba and your trumpet have three vowels. There okay. are seven notes in a scale. C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C. And then you okay. have your sharps and your flats. You still have to figure out how you're going to get all those notes for three vowels, which means that you're manipulating mm. your mouth when you're buzzing into the mouthpiece. I'm not doing that. Mm, okay. So I left all the horned instruments there. The reeded <laughs> instruments, you have to take your cardboard reed, reed, okay, moisten it, stick it in the mouthpiece, and you have to put your bottom lip over your bottom teeth like this. Mm. Then you have to press the reeded instrument down, which causes here mm-hmm. to get bruised. I am too cute and I'm not bruising <laughs> my lips for no instrument. So the oboes, the clarinets, and the saxophone stayed right there. Okay. I looked at the drums. The drums looked at me and said, don't even bother coming over here. <laughs> so the only instrument that was left was the fluxy flute. <laughs> I remember coming home going, I have playing the flute. And he goes, <laughs> you couldn't find a violin or right. a viola. Right, or right. None of the stringed instruments. I said, no, this isn't Psalms. There are no stringed instruments in this band. <laughs> so he goes, Fine, I guess you can play the flute. So for three years, I played the flute. I get to high school. You're joining the band? I said, no, I think I want to join the choir. So I said, there's two choirs. There's the gospel choir, and mm-hmm. then there's the classical choir. He said, if you come home with anything, Jesus, me, me and you have a problem. <laughs> I said, um, why can't I Why can't I go in the gospel choir? He said, because that doesn't challenge you. Mm. Go to the classical choir. In the classical choir, you're singing four and five part harmony and all of the songs are in Latin. Mm. So I learned how to stand like this. Mm. I learned how to breathe with my stomach and not breathe with my shoulders. So that's where I got my first formal training. Even though I had I had been singing since I was three, my first solo was, I am a promise, I am a possibility, I am a promise with a capital T. I am a great big bunch of love, potentiality. Three in the middle of the church choir. My parents were just like, oh, oh, God. <laughs> I think we made a mistake. <laughs> we put her in the front. We should have sat her down. But from singing the choir at three to playing the piano at five, playing the flute at 10, being in a classically mm. trained choir at 13. And then when I went to college, he was like, now you can join the gospel choir. And it made sense because I was at a heathen school. He said, you need all the Jesus you can get. So you are going to the gospel choir. <laughs> that is not an option. You will not be in the classical choir in college because you that will lose all of hilarious. your Jesus. So he was very strategic in making right. sure that I was always in some music program. Mm. Um, left college, came home, and then I joined the praise and worship team. And that's when I realized, ooh, this is the fun part of worship. But by then, I could read sheet music. Mm. By then, I could say, put me in the key of. Mm. By then, I could say, you're flat. This is actually your correct note. By then, I could teach voices and teach the vocals and say, hold on. Mm. If we're going to sing that chord, then the keyboard needs to sing a different 
note or the keyboard, the key, the keys needs to play a different chord. And mm. if that's the chord that you're going to play, well, then the bass needs to do this. And if that's what you're going to do, then the guitar. So now I'm reconstructing music mm. for praise and worship because I didn't like what the artist did. Wow. So we're going to redesign this whole thing so that it actually makes musical sense to the mm. point where now when I walk into that particular church, the band sits up like this. I'm five one. The whole band. Y'all know we're, we're going to be in here for 45 minutes because Hannah doesn't play. Right. <laughs> so when it comes to music, I've been doing this. I'm not new to this. I'm true to this. I've been doing this for many, many years. Wow. Um, I dream music. Mm. Like I have dreamt, I never get words. I'm jealous of the people that get words. So you songwriters out there, I'm so jealous of you. What yeah. I get is the actual <laughs> arrangement. Mm. So I will dream the composition of the song mm. and I can never remember it. <laughs> On the wow. rare occasion that I do, I incorporate it in praise and worship. So that's actually how I got my start and I will never turn back. Hey, I know you've been watching this episode and I know you've been wondering, like, how can I impact the world as a biblical entrepreneur? Well, one way that you can impact the world as a biblical entrepreneur is to wear the uniform of biblical entrepreneurs. Right. Look, we have designs for both men and women so that they can actually wear what they are and what they are becoming. So if you are a biblical entrepreneur, visit www.lionelmosby.com. That's www.lionelmosby.com. So you can get the merch that proves that you are about impacting the world. Let's get back to the episode. Wow. You know, that's amazing. You know, it's, first of all, we if you have a mother or a father out there, who is wise enough, right, to to see where your gifting is, you know, please praise Jesus, right? Mm -hmm. Because it is such a blessing, right, to have someone who is there along the way to help you, to assist you, not, not to force, right, but to guide, right, you into your gifting. It is so important. It is so, so important. And um, what what came out and what I heard throughout it, was how important it is to challenge yourself, right? M many of us, many people maybe out there, somebody who's watching, the reason that you haven't reached the level that you desire to reach, it's not because you, can't, it's not you can't reach that level. Uh -huh. it's, not, it's not that it's not possible, right? The reality is, right, we're too comfortable and we need to challenge ourselves, right? Because, and to piggyback on that, you have no, people in your community that don't push you. Mm. Everyone in your community is in the same tax bracket that you're in. Mm. And I'm going to hurt someone's it. feelings. Uh, if everyone in your friend circle is making $30,000 a year, uh, you all have $30,000 yes. a year goals. You yes. all have a $30,000 a year mindset. And mm. that's okay if there's one person in your crew with a $15,000 a year budget, right? So when I was in college, and I would see the older girls of my church go out to a new brunch spot. I would go, oh, that's dope. I want to be able to do that. And then when I got to the point where there's a joke on Instagram that was like, girls are broke. Have you ever seen them at a girl's brunch? Bottomless <laughs> mimosas and guacamole on everything. And it's true, right? When you get to that kind of mindset of women, the conversations are different. Different, yes. So if everyone in your group is in the same tax bracket that you're mm. in, you're having those kinds of conversations. Mm. So with my girlfriends, we're all business owners. Right. All of us are. One is an interior designer. One is a doula and a caterer and a chef. The other is a mental health counselor. One is a financial advisor. One, Another one is a guidance counselor. Uh, I'm missing somebody. Another one is a fashion um, consultant. Mm -hmm. Our conversations are different. Yes. They're not the conversations of, oh, what'd you do this weekend? The conversation is more like, okay, so you had a to-do list this weekend. How many things right. on your to-do list did you accomplish? Come on now. Come on. <laughs> um, one of them asked me the other day, how much is it going to cost to trademark your name? So how many clients do you need to secure to make a deposit for your trademark? Okay. Yes. Um, yes. What's another conversation that we have? Uh, Zainab, that's the chef. Right. She'll say something like, OK, so your next event, I'm catering it for you. And I'm like, great. So I'm going to compensate you because I don't play that mess of not paying right. my friends 
what right. they're worth, right? right? So when you have certain conversations with people, it shifts your mindset. Mm. We joke and say, I want to be able to go to Dubai and hire a babysitter with the children while I go ride a camel somewhere because I'm in a tax bracket to do that. And right. I have friends that are not trying to nickel and dime a waiter at a mom and pop diner. Mm. You bought steak pay the steak price. Don't say that there's hair in the food because you can't afford the steak, but you really crave steak, right? Mm. So your mindset changes. So a lot of us are not where we should be. Like you said, it's not because we can't do it. We don't have the company to push us. Your poem is having, it's a conversation with two individuals and one yes. is in, in, encouraging the other to take the leap and jump. And all he's saying is, what if I fail? You, you really think mm. me as your friend, I'm going to encourage you to jump and then watch you fail. Right. Then I wouldn't be your friend. I'd be your <laughs> right. foe. Right. You think I am going to sit here and not encourage you to jump hmm. knowing that you're not going to fail. Your fears are telling you that, but that's not the reality. It's you're going to soar. You just need to know that I got your back. Hmm. Even if you fall, hmm. you better believe I'm going to have a parachute next to you. Like, hold this, pull this. All right, take a deep breath and you're going to land safely. And there's going to be a group of people waiting for you to give you a hug and say, we got this. Mm. Take three months. Take some time off. We got your bills. Refigure this and then come back again. So you're absolutely right. Most of us are not where we should be, not because we can't do it. We don't have the right people in our corner. Some of us need to let some of our friends go because mm. they're not helping you. Mm. Wow. that. That's powerful. You know, we, we we might as well give people some homework right now. You know what I mean? Like, hey, if you say, I want to be at this place, right? I, I, I would like to do what they're doing. You know what? You, you need to go have a conversation with somebody that's in that bracket, that's in that group. Get that a mentor. You desire <laughs> to be yes. in. And don't approach yes. them and say, can I pick your brain? Approach them and say, how could I assist you? All right. How, how could I help? What? Because you think that you can't benefit people because you say, well, I'm here, there, there. But that's not true either. Right. All of us has unique gifting and skills. We we can benefit. Right. We can be a blessing. So, hey, you got homework now. I love giving homework. I'm a teacher at heart. You know what I'm saying? Me too. Go. Oh, we, that's what I'm saying. We, that's why we got to give the people some homework. Right. You know what I'm saying? By the next time you come watch one of these podcasts, you need to be leaving a comment about who you approach, who you talk to, and who you hanging out with this next weekend, okay? Ooh, All right? <laughs> let, let's add a part two on that. Oh, add it. Who Go are, ahead, add who, it. Who are you, you going to ask for help? Mm, who is in your crowd and who right you now. need to drop? Who? So those, th those are your, that's your part A, your part B, part and your B part C. And part C. Who, part A is your Give mentor. Again. Okay. Part yes. B is your crowd. All right. Part C is who you need to drop. And we you go. can't go into January with certain people. In, in, sorry. It's, 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 we, we got three parts of the homework right now. We need that information today. That's today, it. Right. So you're going to drop, drop it, it in the comments. And we're going to hold you accountable because I love holding people accountable. <laughs> oh, man. I, I, we're no, going to hold you this accountable. Is, this is awesome. This is awesome. Man, Miss Hannah, you're giving the people some, some good stuff. You know what I mean? We're helping people to scale up right now. I love it. I That's love it. it. <laughs> So, so now I, I want to understand now, you know, I know you had talked about, right. You know, you took that STEMI, right. Um, you went, and put, put it down on the LLC. Uh, you started putting in the work, right. To get to this point of getting this master class together. Right. I, I want you to tell us a little bit more about this master class, right. Um, that you got going, right. And what is it that, who is it that you help, right. And how you're actually using your gifts, your talents to help them. So this is a question. How many times have you been to a church and the praise and worship brought you to the throne room of grace, but it made your ears bleed? Mm, wow. Wow. Okay. <laughs> so you were, you're in worship, but you're like, I don't know if that, mm. I don't know if that's the right note. Okay. Here's the next one. How many times have you been to praise and worship and the vocals and the bands were on point? Like they were tight they're doing everything they're supposed to do. But as soon as they took the mic, Holy Spirit, Jesus and God exited the building. Mm. So yeah. I fix both. Wow. Okay. So I go into churches and I look at your worship experience. Worship is supposed to, one, honor God. It is a conversation with God set to music. Worship mm. is a lifestyle, right? Mm. So what you do should honor God. 
how you speak should honor God. Um, there's a, 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 a joke that's on TikTok and Instagram that's like, uh, I'm from the south side of heaven. <laughs> You're not going <laughs> to play with me, right? So as a Christian, I'm not soft, right? So let's not mistake the two. Self-advocacy and softness are not the same. So right. I'm going to tell you, you're passing your place, but I'm going to do so in grace where you realize that what you did was wrong and I had to do no work and no effort. Mm -hmm. That's a little gem. Take it back. Right. <laughs> so I go into churches and I look at the presentation of your worship, not your mm. performance. The difference between a presentation and a performance is one is normalized and one changes when the camera comes off. Beyonce mm. is not Beyonce on stage on stage right. that is Sasha Fierce. When lights, camera, action are off, she goes back to being Beyonce. The mm. difference between a worship leader and Beyonce is you are presenting what you do at home. So mm. I can tell you who does not worship at home wow. based on what they present in the congregation. Wow! If you have okay. to bully me to get into praise and worship, then you don't do it at home because what the congregation is wow. responding to is your worship. If I stand up and I say, Lord, you're mighty, you should be responding to the Lord that is mighty. I shouldn't have to mm. bully you to do it. Wow. So wow. I am looking at the presentation of worship. Hmm. And I'm also looking at the execution of worship. Are you breathing properly? Did you drink enough water? Um, did you have a cup of Lipton tea before you sang? Because nugget, caffeine dries out your vocal cords. So mm. if you're trying to prepare for a gig, do not drink coffee, black tea, or green tea because caffeine will dry out your cords and will make it harder for you to deliver your notes. Mm. Um, where's your sound? There are some people that can shift sound in their body, right? So right now, as I'm talking, my sound is here. If I choose to, I can push the sound to my belly. So now it sounds like this because now the sound is in my stomach. But if mm. I shift it back up to my chest, now the sound is here. And if I put the sound in my head, the sound is here. So I can tell the sound where it's to go in my body. There mm. are some people that can bend sound. That's Melvin Crispell. He opens his mouth to sing, he moves his hand and the notes contort, right? So when it comes to worship, we have to be mindful that when we are worshiping a sovereign and a holy God, we can't give him crap and mess. Mm. I am so tired of God having to come in and bless the crap that we give to him because he doesn't want to be embarrassed. Mm. Because we do this all the time. We don't practice. We don't rehearse. Mm. And we say, God's going to do it. No, he doesn't want to be embarrassed. Mm. He doesn't want to be embarrassed because the angels are looking at him in heaven like, that's what your kids gave you? <laughs> and he's like mm. Mm. <laughs> yeah they, they don't they don't know what they're doing and the, the angels are just like how you sent your son to die for them how do they not know what they're doing mm. right so love more music is designed for the churches to literally revamp their worship experience so that jesus is pleased and so are my ears right wow. so the first master class that i did was called who we worship, how we worship, and why we worship. So hmm. the first part focused on the Godhead, right? Because a lot of us are worshiping our parents' God, but we're not worshiping our God, Mercy. right? My right. mom is very, I grew up Seventh-day Adventist, right? My mom, both of my parents were very conservative, very, mm -hmm. very, very conservative. Mm -hmm. So up until about, 17, I was worshiping an Adventist conservative God. Then I got to college and saw people speak in tongues. I was like, hold on, what's happening here? Mm -hmm. Then I learned that God is not in a denomination. He exists outside of a denomination, mm -hmm. right? And so most of the time, and this is just my example, most of the times we are worshiping God through the lens of our upbringing and our denomination. And mm -hmm. the problem with that is we don't know God for ourselves. We know right. our grandparents, God, right, we know our right. parents, God, but we don't know him for ourselves. And because mm. we don't know him for ourselves, we're not worshiping him. We're worshiping a figment of who mm. he is. We're worshiping his representative. Mm. 
Mm. So I would encourage you to actually learn who he is for yourself. Learn what mm. his voice sounds like to you. Learn how you respond when he turns up in the room. Mm. Learn how you respond when you're aware of his presence, right? right He's omnipresent, right. right? We don't invite him into like, that's poor biblical doctrine. <laughs> I can't invite right. an omnipresent being into the right. room. Right. right. That would be like <laughs> you inviting me onto this live that I'm already on. Right. You don't exactly. invite me into the room. What you do is you tell the viewers that I'm here. You make them aware of who mm. I am, but you don't invite me. So if we're applying the same principle, I don't invite Holy Spirit in a room. I just make you aware that he's here. And right. once you acknowledge his presence, you then need to go in the backseat and let him do whatever he wants to do. So yes. if he feels like casting out demons you let him do it if he mm -hmm. feels like healing you let him do it if he feels like prophesying you let him do it if he feels like worshiping you let him do it and in mm -hmm. letting him do it now the congregation is able to respond but mm -hmm. you must do so in spirit and in truth and in decency and in order right so before you can even learn how to worship him and before you can even learn why you worship him you first have to learn who you're actually worshiping mm -hmm. You're worshiping him because, insert personal reason here, Ooh. you don't have a personal reason if you don't yes. actually spend time with him. Yes, yes, yes. So yes. I can worship a God who provides because I know what it felt like not to know where my rent money was coming yes. from. Yes. I can worship a God who heals because I know what it feels like to be a frequent flyer in an emergency room. Mm. I can worship a God who covers me because I know what it feels like to be left exposed and vulnerable. Mm. So because I know who I'm worshiping and right. because I know, and that why changes every moment that I get into worship, that why doesn't stay the same. I might start with the memory of a why, but I don't end my worship on that memory. At the conclusion of my worship, I now have a new why. That's mm. how this works. So wow. I might go into worship <laughs> remembering the right. God who provided. I might leave worship acknowledging the God who gives direction. Mm. I might start worship and rem remembering the God who gives direction. I might end worshiping the God who covers. I might wow. start worshiping the God who covers. I'm going to end worshiping the God who loves me. So mm. you start worshiping on a memory, but you must always end your worship with something new or you mm. did not worship. You That's just perform whether intimately or That's publicly. Point. So once point. you learn who you worship and once you learn why you worship, there is how you worship, right? That's the spirit and the truth. The spirit is like the leaves of a tree. The, the root is the truth of the tree. You can go off spontaneously and prophetically all you want to, but the thing that grounds you is the word of God. So you yes. have to have his word literally in your heart so that you're not Amen. flying off on something that cannot be grounded in scripture. Mm. So the mat, I kicked off my business starting with that. Wow. I, I, so now the next, the wow. next masterclass in when <laughs> Love More Music turns to, or yeah, the next masterclass of Love and Music Turns to will be the congregational's response to worship. So how should the congregation respond mm. when worship is present? So yeah. I didn't wow. mean to get all excited, but no, 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 no. I look, first of all, I get excited. My wife will tell you, okay. When I get excited, I get loud and I and I get there. Okay. So I'm I'm feeling it. And you hit so many points that's like so powerful right and it and your master class connected with with a statement that you had made earlier with when you were saying look when we're in a congregation and when you're when you're you know when you're inviting people uh, to to worship with you right you shouldn't have to force somebody to worship because it's really just an expression of what you're already doing in your own home right in your own experience and i'm like that makes so much sense it makes so much sense, you know, and we have to have a personal connection with God at that this personal relationship, right? That outflows right into these other areas where the 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 experience is now corporate, you'll say, right? You know what I'm saying? Same thing with somebody who's speaking or preaching, right? If I don't have that connection with God at home, if he's not giving me those aha moments when I'm just in my devotion of saying, Lord, this is good, right? then that's not going to then manifest itself now when I'm now presenting to the people, right? It, it is just a performance now, right? 
but we don't want to be performers. You know, we want to be worshipers of God, right? We want it to be, no, this is me when I'm at home, when I'm at worship, when I'm, when I'm, you know, out and about, when I'm with my friend, I'm the same, just, just like Jesus says, right? The same yesterday, today, and forever. He's trying to get us to that same place to where we're, there's no difference in us. We're not changing and putting on mask and face for these people, for this person. No, no, no. We're the same all through and through. Man, that man, look, if you, if you got it, I already want to get this master class for my people. OK, that's all I know. So I, if you out there and you watching this, I know you probably thinking the same thing. And since you are, the information is going to be all in the description so you can reach out to Miss Hannah Love, because at the end of the day, we want to have that type of experience where we can usher people in to where they can meet Jesus at the foot of the cross, no matter where we are. Right. You know, what I mean, and so now I, I want to ask you a question, though, because. I remember you said you came back to the church and because you had now gotten all these this formal training, you were able to see like, hold up, you know, we need to we need to change this pitch. OK, we need, we need to do this right with with these instruments. Um, we, need to, we need to kind of change up the voices and how they're coming out. Right now, what was it, though, that helped you to understand that, you know what, there's a pain point here amongst the churches. Right. You know, not just even in my particular domination. Right. But I see it even in other churches that. I see that there's an issue, there's a need here for a better worship experience. What was that moment that that really completely resonated with you that you said, I have to start really teaching what God has poured into me these last few years? So when I when I became a worship leader, it wasn't something I wanted. I was I actually have stage fright and I'm very introverted, right? Hmm. Um, when my former worship leader would present worship, I would stand directly behind him. So if he moved to the left, I moved to the left because I didn't want the camera to see me. <laughs> um, eventually he was like, yeah, that's not going to work. <laughs> Go in the corner. And he would strategically place me outside of the view of the camera so I could normalize being on camera. Okay. Um, then I realized uh, that I actually liked leading worship. Um, and what happened was when he left, the church was like, make Hannah the worship leader. And I was like, no, <laughs> I want to find somebody else. I want to, I like singing back up. And they were like, yeah, well, you really don't have a choice. <laughs> You'll be on a trial period for three months. I want to, I don't like this. Send me somewhere else. And after like the first two or three weeks, I realized, oh, this is fun. I want to keep doing it. So I started taking classes. If there was a workshop anywhere, I would sign up for the workshop, whether free or not, and I was there. The workshop could be in Connecticut. I was there. The workshop could be in Brooklyn. I was there. I lived in Mount Vernon at the time. The workshop could be in Upper Westchester. I didn't care. I was getting to the workshop because I realized that I liked to do this thing, and right. I also understood that I needed to be properly trained on how to do this thing. Right. Then I would come back to my church and I would, of course, me being me, just share the knowledge that I have. And then you could see a shift in the presentation of worship. Hmm. When you're a singer, right? That's, that's part A, part B. When you're a singer and you sing well and you're professional, right. you get invited to sing in other spaces. Hmm. And now you can, you have, uh, uh, now you can compare. Comparisons, right. And now I'm just like, okay, you have that on lock, but you're lacking here. And you have this here, but you're lacking there. Or you are lacking in nothing. Or you just need developing all around. So two years ago, I was at Resting Place in Jersey. And uh, God started to talk um, in the way that he always does. And he was like, hey, do you want to know what I put you on earth to do? And I was like, I don't like this question. <laughs> I know where it's going. I don't like this question. What'd you put me on earth to do? Music? Um, yay. So I get to be a, a, a background vocalist. No. Hmm. Okay. I get to be a worship leader. No, you're going to teach people how to do this thing. I don't want mm -hmm. to. And I literally went down the list of all the people I felt I could do it better. And he said, no, I didn't, I didn't call them. I called you. If I called hmm. them, then I wouldn't be talking to you about this. Mm. This isn't a case of I called them and they rejected it. This is a case of I did not call them to do that. Mm. And so I realized in going to different churches and intentionally getting trained in different spaces, I realized that there isn't a school that does it all. Hmm. 
There isn't a one-stop shop where you can learn how to lead worship, understand the point of worship, and then learn how to deliver it. Hmm. So that's when I was like, all right, so how do you want your school to look? Because clearly it's not mine. Right. <laughs> how, how do you want this to look? And he would say, all right, open your laptop. And when I say he would wake me up at random times of the night, I hated it. I love to sleep. It's my favorite pastime. Um, I enjoy my bed. As we speak, my bed is drafting up divorce papers because I don't spend enough time in my bed. Bed thinks I don't love it anymore and thinks right. that I've gone onto greener pastures. He would wake me up. Open up your laptop. You need to write. I don't want to. I want to sleep. Or um, I would. I worked at a residential treatment facility. And when the children were sleeping, he'd go bring your laptop to work. And for the first three hours of my shift, while my residents were sleeping, I was working. Right. Right. So it, it, I realized that there was a deficit when you would go to different spaces and you realize that there were pieces that were lacking. And if their worship leaders just had three months of training, they wouldn't have these issues. Hmm. Right. I realized that if I have to go to 10 different locations to get 10 different types of knowledge, maybe there should be a place where I can go and get it. When you go to a college, you go to one college for all of your, for your entire degree career. So if you're going to school for your bachelor's, you go to one school for your bachelor's. You don't go to this school for bio and that school for math and that mm -hmm. school for English. Right. One school should be able to pride everything. So why is right. it in the church? We go to one conference for this and one retreat for that and one workshop. Why not just create something mm. where everything is in one place? Right, right, right. So that's where it came from. I still fight him sometimes. Um, <laughs> He still gives me ideas that I think are way bigger than me. Um, mm. And 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 they are, but that's why you're connected to him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so so when I fuss, I don't I don't want I don't want him to hear it. I, you told me to do it. I did it. I don't like it. I don't want to sometimes. But I'm doing it because you told me to do it. Right, right. So yeah, now, so, so that's what, where it started. What was that? What was that? Uh, maybe that impact that you had from when you started right to you know god is now pouring right he's downloading this information to you what was that impact for that one church or maybe that one worship leader right that you had on them with what you shared that really helps you to see and understand okay this is this is why god called me to this so adventist culture and again i can only speak for the culture that i come from mm -hmm. um and this is not to bash I'm not bashing, right? Adventist culture is naturally very conservative. Adventists mm -hmm. do not speak in tongues. They do not operate in the charismatic gifts. Mm -hmm. Very biblically sound. And I'm not saying it because I'm biased. I'm saying it because I've heard some of y'all doctrine. Right. It's a little interesting. <laughs> okay. However, um, I would go back into Adventist spaces and I would see how the congregation would respond. Mm -hmm. And I would go, oh, I would train other worship leaders and then sit in the congregation and watch the before and after. And they go, oh, the church has never responded like that before. Mm. Or I would have someone say, I have been going to Adventist churches my whole life and I have never seen worship like that before, mm. ever. Um, I have seen pastors break out spontaneously in worship in the middle of their sermon and it was not scripted. I have seen pastors stand up to preach. And again, in Adventist culture, this is not the norm. Mm -hmm. I've seen Adventist pastors or elders stand up to speak and they cannot start preaching because they are still worshiping. And that's when I'm like, there might be something here. Mm -hmm. I'm going to keep doing this thing because <laughs> there might be something here. Even though I'm scared, I'm going to do it. So for me, that was it. Actually seeing people mm. respond to worship, seeing the congregation grow, mm. um, seeing the congregation excited for praise and worship, mm. uh, seeing the congregation not want worship to end. Mm. 
So that was it for me. That's awesome. And, you know, that that makes me then also wonder, because it's just like you saying, the people who are leading out in worship, it needs to be an outflow of what worship they're having at home. So now it also leads me to say, okay, now when congregations are experiencing, right, worship in, in a in a way that's really impacting them from the front, right, coming to the congregation, is that now also helping them to have a different experience of worship at home, right? You know, and so it's like it comes full circle. And, you know, that's also, also something that, that you wonder about and think about and say, man, you know, when are those conversations going to start, you know, making and trickling their way back to you of saying, you know, man, I've been having a different, you know, uh, a spiritual life, you know, Mm -hmm. since these things have changed, you know, I've been really getting in my word more, you know, and studying more uh, since this thing have changed, you know, and that's at the end of the day, the the, the the desire is to have a connection with Jesus like we've never had before that each and every day will be more lovely, more sweet, you know, more perfect. Right. And that's what we really want to get to is Mm -hmm. get to that point. Now I I know it's good when I, when I see a person who normally does not respond to worship uh, in the way that we're used to, everyone's response is different. So some people's response is just really quiet and they'll rock back and forth. Right. And some people will jump up and down and scream and shout. I will never right. tell someone what their response should look like. I just want you to respond. Right. right. And I'm always shocked when I'll go to a conservative group and I see the most conservative pastor pull out their phone to record. <laughs> <laughs> that that always tickles me. <laughs> or when I'm randomly on Obama's internet, um, <laughs> on somebody's Facebook, right, and right. I see a random older member in the church post. So in church last week, so-and-so sang this for praise and worship and I can't get it out of my head. And it's the same song I sang two weeks ago. Mm. That's when I'm like, this means that for the past two weeks, you've been worshiping to this song. Mm. Every time you hear it, you trip and fall into worship. Good job. I did my job. Or Holy Spirit did his job. So that's really all that it is. Once people are intentionally going home and continuing worship and now they're bringing that continued worship into the worship space the following week yeah right that's what it is that's awesome man that's awesome you know i want to uh get a chance i know we get to a point we're gonna wrap up it's been it's been so good (laughs) you know it's been so good just having this conversation with you Mm -hmm. and i'm just gonna take a brief moment just to uh talk about our sponsor uh for this week but as we when we come back i want you to think about you know for other individuals who are in the church right wherever they may be they they love music they love their artistry but they're trying to really figure out okay how do I monetize this thing? Right. Or how do I even get over my fear? Right. Of seeking to monetize this thing. Right. What are some things that you can share with them? Maybe some tips you can give them um, to help them. Right. To encourage them in that. Right. So can you do that for us? All right. Awesome. 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 So I just want to talk about. No, 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 the sponsor. Yeah, I want to talk about our sponsor for this week. It is Tent Makers 101. Tent Makers 101, where Christian principles fuel business practices. You may be asking, like, are you a tent maker? Look, if you have a gift, a talent, a product, a service, any type of business that is seeking to follow in Jesus's footsteps and meet the needs of the community so you can impact them with the everlasting gospel, then you are a tent maker. We're meeting every day on Facebook with other entrepreneurs in order to foster growth, collaboration, and strategic partnerships for increasing your brand awareness and your revenue. We truly believe every business is a ministry. When you accomplish God's purposes for you in the world in the form of products and services that provide true value to your particular audience, then guess what? You're truly successful. So don't wait. Join us on Facebook now at Tentmakers 101 biblical entrepreneurship so miss hannah go ahead you got the floor share with share with us right how we can monetize these gifts of artistry that we have and not and not be fearful or afraid right of of you know the the church members or those who will say what are you doing you know what i mean so this part of the, the the show i'm gonna step on some toes um don't move your foot out the way Amen. Great. Cool. So (laughs) there is this bad theology that we have concerning money. 
This theology is that we shouldn't make it. Mm. I don't know what lie, what part of hell that lie came from, <laughs> but it can be returned. No, <laughs> okay. Let's start right there. Uh, Jesus did not eat air for his entire existence. He ate food. The food came from somewhere. That is true. Okay. Paul had a job. He created tents. Mm -hmm. uh, Luke was a doctor. Judas was an accountant. Matthew was a tax collector. Mm -hmm. It is okay to have income. Mm -hmm. The difference between income and exploitation is your motive. Mm. Okay. Do not tell me that you're a prophet sent to the nations with no passport. What nation are you going to? <laughs> Do not tell me you're a prophet sent to the nation and the Arab guy downstairs doesn't know that you're a believer. You're not sent to the nations. What you are are sent to other Christian groups of people in diverse nations but you are not a prophet sent to the nations because prophets sent to nations do not need a, 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 a ticket to go. They get on a plane and they buy it and they go themselves. That right. being said, when it comes to financially monetizing your gifts, you're not exploiting the people of God. However, shameless plug, Love More Music is planning a, a worship leaders retreat, mm -hmm. right? Worship leaders, we don't rest. Every week we go to church, someone expects us to sing. Someone expects us to do something, right? I can't tell you how many concerts I've gone to. And they're like, oh, Hannah's here. Come sing. And I'm like, I want to. I, I want someone to sing to me. I don't want to right. sing to no one else. I want someone to sing to me. So the worship retreat is designed for worship leaders to just come and have someone minister to them. Just there will be non-traditional ways that you worship. Um worship and painting, worship and journaling, worship and stretching, round table talks where you just get to vent. That is a $15,000 event. Mm -hmm. You know who's not paying for it? <laughs> Tickets are $250 a person because I have overhead costs. Mm -hmm. Love More Music has overhead costs that causes the business to run the way the business does. Right. The ministry is the 30 minutes that you see me in church. The business happens after that. Right. Okay. So when it comes to marketing and monetizing, the first person you must go to when it comes to putting a price tag on something is the person who gave you the business idea. Hmm. We are all believers. It's safe to assume that this business idea came from Jehovah. So go holler at him and ask him what your <laughs> ticket prices should be. Because I promise if you ask him what the ticket prices would be, you would not charge the price that you're charging. I can start mm -hmm. right there. Some of y'all are charging $500 for a conference. And y'all spoke in tongues for more than half of it and said it was a high move of God. Where? <laughs> I didn't take anything home. Mm. Some of y'all are charging for things y'all learned on Google. Mm. You have to do Ooh. a certain amount of hours to master a skill. Most of y'all just started doing this yesterday. You haven't mastered anything. You don't get to teach me something you haven't mastered. Right. So somehow in the body of Christ, we think that we should not put a dollar sign on something. When I charge for something, it's because Jesus gave me a number. Hmm. That's the spiritual part of it. Here's the practical part of it. In order for Hannah to provide a vocal coaching session for a person, I have to look at the currency of my time. Mm -hmm. Okay? I have to look at how many years it took me to master this skill. You are not paying me $60 for 45 minutes to get your vocals to where it needs to be. Do you know what you're paying me for? Mm. You are paying me for the 10 years it took me to get your vocals right. together in 45 minutes. Big right, right, right. You are paying me to look at your body and see your diaphragm fold while you sing because that's literally what happens. I can see you sing and literally see what your lungs are doing. Mm. 
Mm-hmm. I can hear that your lungs are operating at 40% capacity. I can tell you that you took a deep breath and you thought it was deep, but it was actually shallow because your air stopped here and bounced right back up. I didn't learn that yesterday. Mm-hmm. Some of it is a gift, yes. But I didn't learn that yesterday. This is years. You are paying me to get your vocals together in 45 minutes. You're not paying me for the 45 minutes that you spent, mm. right? So when I'm when, when there's a price tag, Jesus gave me the number, right? Argue mm-hmm. with him. <laughs> I'm looking at the currency of my time. I'm looking at the education behind it. I'm looking at the hours that I put into it. I have to pay for sponsored ads on Instagram for people to know I exist, right? Mm -hmm. Y'all, y'all say what y'all want to say about sponsored ads. When you watch TV, you spend your episodes are only 18 minutes long. The actual episode itself is 18 minutes or 44 minutes, 18 for 30, which means that six of those minutes or seven of those minutes, whatever the number is, then it goes for math are commercials. (laughs) Right, so if right. Target can pay for a commercial, why can't you pay for a sponsored ad on Instagram? It's the same thing. It's just where you're, where the commercial is going. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Right? Okay. So I have to look at how much it costs to... I actually have a spreadsheet of all of the subscriptions that I have for my business to run. Mm-hmm. I know how much my business expenses are. Right. Okay. So I know that I have to pay Zoom if I'm hosting, hosting virtual sessions. That's $25 a month. I know that I have to pay for a StreamYard account for when I'm doing The Artist Speaks. I know that I have to pay for what's something else that I pay for. Ooh. I'm trying to think. It's on the tip of my tongue. Google Play. Mm -hmm. Or what used to be Google Play. That's now YouTube Music, right? Mm -hmm. There are certain things I have to pay for. I'm not running a nonprofit organization. That's love more people. I have a nonprofit. (laughs) <laughs> That's love more people. Go there for free stuff. Don't right. come here for free stuff. Here's right. the next thing. Just because it's free to you doesn't mean it wasn't free for me. If Fact. I choose to absorb a cost, it means that I'm losing money. So it's okay to market yourself appropriately. Mm-hmm. It becomes exploitation when you don't have a job. Now, there's nothing wrong with being a full-time entrepreneur. The difference between exploitation and that full-time entrepreneur is that you are not charging asinine numbers because you don't want to work, Mm. right? We see that all the time where people are charging $10,000 to revamp your church's infrastructure, but you don't have a successful congregation. You Mm. have five people at best in your building and you don't have a COO that runs the floor while y'all are out there running around prophetically, right? right? So it's okay to understand that your business is just that. It's a business. Just because you are marketing to believers doesn't make it any less a business. Right, right. Holla at God. Ask him what your <laughs> number should be. Look at how much it's going to cost for you to run this program, event, whatever, right? Mm-hmm. For my retreat, I have to pay the caterer to feed people. I have to pay the items that go in the goodie bag. I have to pay for the space that I'm renting. I have to pay the musicians. I have to pay the vocalists. I have to pay the speaker. I have to pay the instructors. I have to pay a fee, which means before I profit, my break even is $15,000. For some of y'all, that's your yearly salary. Right. So before... I pray not, but (laughs) some of y'all, that's half of your yearly salary or maybe a third of your yearly salary, right? Right, right, If we're being very practical, Mm -hmm. if I know I have to pay a speaker, someone has to pay for that. Y'all don't want to come to an event and then have to go outside and buy food. Right. You don't want to come to an event and then have to turn around and figure out where you're going to sleep at night. You don't want to come to an event and then still have to pay for a shirt. These are things that come under the cost. So when you are when when I decided what I should pay or what I should charge per person, I looked at everything tallied up and divided it by the amount of guests that I'm allowed to have in the building. Right. And for this event, I didn't even add my service fee on it because if I were, each ticket would be 350. 
-hmm. because I still have to profit. So right. we have to make sure that we're running a business. Uncle Sam will audit you. Everything cannot be a tax break. Right. Um, you have overhead bills. You have overhead costs. Make sure that you have an accountant. Make sure that someone is doing your financials properly. So it took me a while to feel comfortable enough to charge people because I was afraid. I felt guilty. And then I realized, you know who doesn't feel guilty when they charge what they charge? Hmm. Target. And we buy a Target all the time. <laughs> we don't go to Michael Jordan and ask him to haggle his price for his sneakers. We pay right. the full price of the sneaker. Mm -hmm. We don't go to Louis and Gucci and ask them to give us the family and friends discount. Either you're paying $500 for a belt that's this thin or you don't get the belt. <laughs> So yeah. don't do that to your friends that are starting a business. Don't ask them for a family and friends discount because they are taking their nine to five check to fund this thing, knowing that one of y'all are going to ask for 50% off and they get mad yeah. when we don't give it to you. Yeah. So that's true. Hopefully that answered your question. No, it did. That was great. And I mean, to be honest, if people saw the, the price for Jordans and they were too low, they probably would think that they're fake in the first place. Right. So the truth is, our price is a part of our marketing. Our price is a part of showing people that we're experts at what we do. When we charge too low, sometimes it actually, you know, it actually deters people from actually yeah. thinking that we actually can do what we say we can do. Right. And so we mm -hmm. definitely need to keep that in mind uh, as we're moving forward. But man, Miss Hannah, I really appreciate you. I know that the people love uh, all the information that you shared with them. Definitely gives them something to think about, consider, um, not just, you know, from a biblical entrepreneurship standpoint, but also in, a, in, in the terms of them and even their worship, right? Um, and so uh, how can people get in touch with you and get in contact with you if they're saying, look, I'm interested in this masterclass or this ebook or just to find out a little bit more about what you do? Um, how can they get in contact with you? So I have a website. It's called lovemoremusicllc.com. It has all of the information on there, the services that we offer. Um, the retreat is on there. It sales or tickets. Blah, blah, blah. You can purchase your ticket November 1st, right? I do offer payment plans because we are still yet in a panoramic, right? Um, but <laughs> you can find me at www.lovemoremusicllc.com. Everything is on there. My Instagram is love period more period music. Okay. Um, and then my personal Instagram Instagram is miss underscore Hannah underscore love. So you can find me on either of those platforms. Check out what we're doing. If you feel like you might not need your serv the services, I promise you there is someone that does. And just forward it. Mm -hmm. A like, a share, a follow. It doesn't hurt. So that's where you can find me. Hey, man. Well, we want to thank you so much. Again, all that information will be in the description. So you can just scroll down whether you're watching on YouTube or whether you're listening on Apple, Google, Spotify, Amazon Music, wh wherever you listen to your podcast. It'll all be there. So you guys can definitely check out Love More Music to be able to get in contact with her for yourself, for your church, right? Um, or if you just say, you know what, I, I want to attend this, you know, this master class. I want to be a part of this. Or, or I want to see, man, how should I react as a, a part of the congregation? Because we got that coming up as well uh, with Miss yeah. Hannah, too. So, um, but we want to thank you guys for listening in, for watching the Lion and the Lambo podcast. Where we talk about biblical entrepreneurship, impact, and true success. And we want to hope and pray that you would take this information, take your gift, take your talent, right? And go and start something, right? Go, go, go get something started with what God has blessed you with, right? And don't be ashamed to charge what you charge because you are worth what you're worth. All right. Until next time. See you later. Bye.